Father and Father. Well, he's been preaching the pure milk of God's word for 60 years. And y'all listen to him. You'll see how God can use anyone who will believe him. Even a father from Charlotte, North Carolina. And yes, even you, child. Well, now that we've gotten acquainted, let me tell you how you can have a real fun one. Before you move into the field, by the way, pick up a car. As you walk through the exhibits, see if you can answer the question. And after you're done, go by the bookstore and you can exchange your computer card for a special gift. Now you be sure and tell them Bessie sent you. Now, that we have this thing down inside us. This is what Christ brought. This is what the Bible teaches from Genesis to Revelation. That we have a disease. And this is why Christ came that first Christmas. That's what Christmas is all about. That he came to save us from this disease. Because if this disease ran rampant in the world, it could destroy the human race. Uh, it's not a matter of what I believe. It's uh, what the Bible teaches. And the Bible teaches that premarital sex relations are wrong. You know, explain. To me, that would be like, uh, you know, like driving a car, you know, getting a driver's license without a learner's permit first. Well, let's just, uh, let's just, uh, let's just uh, see. Now, you know, we have to have rules to live by. And uh, what we're saying is, we're going to play a baseball game without any rules. We're going to play a football game without any rules. We're going to live a life without any moral rules. But well, God has laid down certain rules and said, if you want the best of life and you want complete happiness and fulfillment, live by these rules. And one of those rules is that thou shalt not commit immorality. Ah, but wait a minute. But if you're, say you're dating a girl, right? Well, I, uh, I don't intend to date anyone. No, but I am. <laughs> Everybody has broken every commandment. Yes, sir. The Bible says if we break in one point, we're guilty of all. Point. And then when Jesus came after Moses, he explained that the, that the Ten Commandments can be broken in your heart by thought and intent. So in that sense, we're all guilty. And that's the reason the Bible says that everybody's a sinner. Even Ed is a sinner. <laughs> Because all the way God was teaching Israel, all through the Old Testament, that there was one God, only one, that we're to serve and we're to worship. Right, and that doesn't seem to you as, say, an egomaniacal position. On God's part, oh, God's oh no, God is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny, when I look in the mirror in the morning, it's hard for me to believe that. <laughs> You know, in God's sight, you are beautiful. And, in, and everyone <laughs> because, uh, because God loves all of us, and he has the hands of our head numbered, he sees the sparrow fall, he's interested in every detail of your life. He made you like you are. He made you Woody Allen, and he expects you to live up uh, to a standard that he has made. And if you don't live up to it, then the Bible says you're falling short, and that's where you need God's help for redemption. I guess I'm just troubled by the fact that, that we have to put the seed of sin in a little baby. Why don't we relax and just walk well, this on? Yeah, this I'm, I'm, I'm telling you what the Bible teaches, not what I teach. No, I, I, I understand. But you have to come by faith, uh, Phil. Uh, you, you'll never be able to reason it out. If you try to reason it out, you're sunk. Uh, really? Yes. You agree? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> you know, Phil, what you're trying to do and what we're trying to do is to develop a God like ourselves. We, we do not want the revelation of God. We do not want God to say, I'm a God of judgment, I will judge you, and uh, so forth. We don't want that. Right. We want that, to make that's God right in his so that we become mm -hmm. guilty yeah. of idolatry, which is the worst of all things. My basic message has not changed. The message of the fact that uh, the Bible is the authoritative word of God, the fact that Jesus Christ was virgin born, the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins on the cross, the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, the fact that he's coming again, and the fact that you need to repent and receive him as your savior, that hasn't changed. But I do try to keep current, and I try to make my messages relevant by using things right out of the newspaper. What do you see your role as now, Dr. Grant? I'm going to continue to preach the gospel as long as God gives me breath. When I was asked to consider going into motion pictures in 1949 in California. That's what I told uh, those people at that time, and I've told everybody since then when a president has called and asked me to take a certain job or to do something, or somebody's asked me to run for an office, I've told them the same thing. 
And I would say it today as I said it then with even more authority. I intend to preach as long as I have the strength to do it. You will watch your presentation, of course. But the Bible says we're, we're tempted in all points like as Jesus was, except he was without sin. He never did yield to temptations. And uh, the Bible says that uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you can bear. I've been tempted, but not so strong that I couldn't bear it if I turned it over to God. And I always pray, Lord, help me. And especially when I was younger, at my age now, those temptations are not quite strong. <laughs> are you optimistic about the millennium? Oh, of course. I'm optimistic about the one because Jesus Christ will be the Messiah. That's what I meant. And he's coming. he's coming. He's coming. No doubt in your mind. No doubt in my mind. Not the slightest. But isn't it true that a hundred years ago, whoever was the Billy Graham, if there was a Billy Graham at that time, was saying the same thing? Probably. I think so. So this is in a frame of reference that we don't know when. And we don't know when. It may be 10,000 years from now. The Bible says a thousand years in God's sight is as but a day. And a day in God's sight may be a thousand years. We don't know. And I think God's frame of reference is different than ours. We're told to watch certain signs. And they're all listed in the 24th chapter of Matthew and the 21st chapter of Luke and so forth. And they're all coming true right now. And for the first time in history, I think all of them are happening right now at the same time. Folks, that's not good. <laughs> you know, that's not our, uh, Be quiet. Oh, no. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. <laughs> um, I actually grew up on the farm. Uh, my parents built our home uh, on Granddaddy's farm. He had 300 acres. Uh, our house was three or four blocks away, but it was still on the farm. In fact, when our house was the first one built in, in what became a subdivision, and uh, it was the cow pasture. So when we stepped outside, we had to watch where we stepped. <laughs> um, yeah, mud pies. Fragrant, fragrant area. <laughs> to this day, when I go, my husband and I go hiking up in the mountains a lot, and where we hike is part of the cow pasture. And, you know, we'll get started and I'll go, Boy, it oh. smells just like home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my husband was raised on a farm, and he, and he just, after 39 years, he's not used to that yet. But to me, it was straight up the road, three and a half miles southeast of here. Um, started out with the acreage and a cow. And after many years of hard work, and worked up to between 70 and 80, he hand milked those, of course, twice a day some cows three times. Hmm. Doing that, he saved $9,000. Strictly from hand milking cows. I can't imagine. Hmm. I can promise you one thing. If I had to milk a cow to have a house, I wouldn't have a house. <laughs> um, he hand milked um, between 70 and 80 uh, to earn that money. They moved in in 1927. The house has been taken apart brick by brick, board by board, and moved twice. Mm -hmm. I know the man who did it, so I know it actually happened, and I've said this thousands of times, because I'm... Mm -hmm. He gives you the joy of truth. He gives you a supernatural power to love your neighbor. There are people here tonight that he's spoken to, and you're ready to leave without him. Whatever your race, whatever your religion, you need Jesus Christ as a person in your life. He's not a creed. He's a person. I don't have to be judged. I don't have to go to hell. I don't have to be lost. My soul has been redeemed. I'm going to hell. But I've got to first repent of my sin and receive Christ as my Lord and my Savior. God is a God of love. He loves you. And if there's one thing I want you to take from this great part when you leave here today, it's this. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. He 
takes away all that stuff that's been causing the emptiness and the trouble, and he gives you a peace and a joy and a sense of forgiveness that you never knew before. How many of you here tonight are broken? Fed up, but you don't know what to do. You give your life to Christ tonight and you will have supernatural help in breaking those chains that bind you. True repentance does not presume upon the grace and the mercy of God. We can only come when the Spirit of God draws us to Christ. You can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the word of God, the Bible. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. He's waiting to receive you with mercy, with love, with open arms, and forgive all your sins. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by, and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying, and the Holy Spirit has been working, and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour, what a moment for you to come. You may never have a tomorrow as far as God is concerned. There are people here tonight that may never be alive tomorrow. You may never hear the gospel again like this. Or your heart may not be this tender toward God. Come while you can. And don't put it off. This whole crusade would be worth it tonight if just you came to Christ. Because it would mean rejoicing in heaven. God is waiting to welcome you with open arms, to receive you as you come to him in repentance and faith. I'm going to ask all of you to come and stand in front of this platform and say, by coming, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to come and forgive me and change me and make me the kind of person I want to be. I want to know that I have eternal life. I want to know if I die, I am going to heaven. You say, why do you ask us to come follow I just reminded you, Jesus hung on the cross for you publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly, I'll not acknowledge you before the Father in heaven. Simple, and yet could be life-changing tonight. And all of heaven will rejoice. You come, we're going to wait on you, men, women, young people. This is your moment. Before God, you come right now. sure of your relationship to Christ, I invite you to pray the following simple prayer after me. Pray it in your heart. Oh God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess Him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow Him in the fellowship of His church. In Christ's name. you with Bible study materials that will help you build your relationship with Jesus Christ. May God bless you in this, your hour of decision.